Hello Wastelanders, Calculus Gingerbread here with another episode of Kato's Countdowns. If you've suffered from a little bit of Fallout fatigue or have gotten what you wanted to out of what the Fallout games have to offer currently, what other post-apocalyptic games will scratch that itch? This countdown is 10 possible answers to that question. I tried to be platform conscious for this countdown as well and make sure that a lot of these games are on multiple platforms, but a couple of them are exclusives for PC. And for post-apocalyptic games, I avoided the zombie genre as much as I could because that could be an entirely different countdown. So with that out of the way, let's get started with 10 tetanus tainted, irreparably irradiated games for Fallout fans that aren't Fallout. Starting off with Polyamorous's Paradise Lost. This one's a linear story told in the shoes of a 12-year-old boy named Shemon. He was raised in the frozen wasteland of 1980s Poland. He's left on his own shortly after the game begins and follows his only clue, a photo of his mother and a man he doesn't recognize. This leads Shemon into a massive, seemingly abandoned bunker where even after the war that leveled most of Europe, nukes were still being developed. While alarming, weapons manufacturing isn't even close to the only thing to discover in this bunker. This game is experience first, game second, and has very little in the way of mechanics or puzzles and instead focuses on telling a story. You'll glean information via notes, audio recordings, and dialogue throughout this game with a few tense moments and environments to admire. If you've been looking to relax and soak up atmosphere and story with something a bit more interactive than a film, Paradise Lost is certainly worth a try. Call of Pripyat is the sequel of GSC Game World's Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, and I believe the third game in the Stalker series. The premise of these games revolve around the aftermath of the explosion of the Chernobyl nuclear reactor in 1986. The area affected by contamination by the Chernobyl event is known as the Zone. The Zone has taken a new shape, full of anomalies, dangerous mutants, other stalkers, and plenty of unexplained phenomena. You play as Agent Alexander Degterev with the objective of discovering what happened to several military helicopters that crashed in the zone with no explanation. The Stalker series is one I've only recently given more of a chance. It took a long time for me to warm up to it thanks to its lack of tutorials, dated appearance, and clunky controls. I'm grateful that I did give Call of Pripyat a chance though because the bleak feeling of this wasteland atmospheric soundtrack and risks with resulting rewards are indeed satisfying. There is a focus on survival elements in Stalker, including the need to reduce radiation levels with vodka or meds, staying fed, scanning for dangers, and only taking equipment you need into the field. I recommended Call of Pripyat over Shadow of Chernobyl here simply because there's numerous changes that make it easier to understand and play than its predecessor. These adjustments only helped so much though because the menus, while functional, are still missing standard features. Call of Pripyat has a plethora of quests to take part in from the locals, as well as some gear customization systems that are enjoyable. The first area's repairman, Cardin, needs to take a drink of vodka for each tier of upgrades for your weapons and armor, and perform a toast before getting to work. Something that took me the longest to figure out was that the stalker economy runs on artifacts. These highly valuable items are found via scanner or a keen eye in anomalies marked around the map. Each of these anomalies are unique, warped portions of the landscape and have their own dangers to avoid. When I survive in games like this, I love to try the stealthy approach too, and while there's sneaking and suppressors in the stalker games, sneaking is near impossible and enemies just seem to sense you no matter what, forcing you to go in guns blazing instead. There is an experience to be had though with Call of Pripyat for sure but it might take you a few hours to warm up to it like it did me. I should mention the, the final downside, which is probably the biggest one, and it's the limitation of platform, and Stalker Call of Pripyat is currently only available as a PC game. On the upside though, as long as your PC isn't 20 years old, you can likely run Stalker just fine. When there's a will, or goodwill, there's a way. Adam RPG by Adam Team is an RPG, in case there was any confusion. This role-playing game takes place in the Soviet wasteland after the mutual nuclear bombings of the Soviet Union and the Western Bloc in 1986. The game begins almost 20 years after this, in 2005. As a member of Adam, you must discover what happened to a missing team sent to recon some bunkers who never returned. This is a big one that I've been meaning to play and this entire countdown motivated me to actually do it. And if you've had difficulty with getting into the classic Fallout games, this is a great way to 
get acclimated to them. I don't only suggest this because of the game's identity, but the sheer amount of platforms this game can be played on, which is to say, pretty much everything except your smart fridge. Atom RPG wears its inspiration to a fault, citing the classic Fallout games as well as Wasteland, Stalker, Baldur's Gate, and Deus Ex. As a person who grew up enjoying Fallout 2, and now has played every Fallout game, there's lots to enjoy here, but also a lot of missteps in my mind. Going in, you should know that my opinion on this game is mixed. By the time I got to the end, I was exhausted by it, but I still had a lot of fun in my 60 hours before that point. The combat and team control are solid. The systems for character creation and the way your build can affect different outcomes of some things is great. And something many games of this type can't boast is that it controls surprisingly well on both keyboard and mouse and with a controller. I ended up switching to controller about halfway through and was pleasantly surprised, especially with the reworked menu. On the other hand, systems like hunger and addiction prove to be more chores than anything, especially when you can get addicted to healing meds. You know, the stuff that's supposed to keep you alive. That's addictive, apparently. And since the only voice is the narration in the beginning and the ending of Atom RPG, there is also a lot of reading to expect, from dialogue to items to books to notes. The descriptions of characters and items are fairly well written, but it's not reading on its own that starts to grate, it's the beating you over the head with the necessary information, memes, and references. If you like NPCs unironically quoting All Star by Smash Mouth in conversation, you'll probably enjoy this aspect more than I did. Lastly, I'd like to mention the plot and progression. The story heavily shadows Fallout 1 with its motivations and twists. I won't spoil this, obviously, but if you've already played the classic Fallout games, the story might feel way too familiar. I've experienced this game as a martial arts focused character and enjoyed my build nearly all the way through. Again, this has been about 60 hours-ish. This game has extra animations for hand-to-hand -hand combos and even had a ballistic fist type weapon that is totally my jam. I very much enjoyed the character building this game offered except when it came to getting my first armor and trying to finish the last fight. Like I said at the start, my opinion is mixed, but this can be a fun experience overall and is a great introduction to isometric style RPGs. Apologies if I start fanboying a little bit. I'm just a fan of super giant games, and one of their games, Bastion, is far more colorful than most post apocalyptic landscapes, hand painted, in fact, but nonetheless takes place after a world splitting event known as the Calamity. Unlike most RPGs, your actions as the kid are also narrated in real time to keep you in the story and add some extra flavor behind each action. You'll fight and explore through the fractured world while strengthening the Bastion, your home base of sorts. You'll find unique weapons and materials to upgrade those weapons and further customization with spirits to grant passive abilities so long as they're equipped. This isn't a game meant to be played over a long period of time. It's roughly a six hour experience that includes new game plus and score attack modes after completion, if you're not done just yet. But what's to say? I. I am a fanboy of Supergiant Games, and if you're curious why these developers sound familiar, that's because they're behind the recent masterpiece known as Hades as well. Even though Bastion was their first project, thanks to the hand-painted art style and arcade combat, this game holds up no matter what year it's played. Combine that with the incredible music, fun gameplay options, and intriguing story, and you've got a well-crafted, playable art piece. It is unfair to assume that this game will work for everyone, especially those of you who like to play 20 to 30 hour RPGs. The simplicity of Bastion's customization makes it easy to digest too, but sometimes can make you want more depth as well. I don't even know if you can call that a negative because it's hard for me to come up with many for Bastion. I much prefer a short game that tells a cohesive story than a lengthy game that draws a story out way too far. And this is a great example of the former. Did I mention that this is available on nearly every platform? If you've got a weekend and don't know what to play, Bastion is a game I'll recommend regularly. Ubisoft's Far Cry New Dawn is a sequel in the Far Cry series that takes place 17 years after the events of Far Cry 5. This universe's version of the apocalypse was known as the Collapse and involved a nuclear exchange that scorched the world. You play as the captain, who is helping the survivors of Hope County against a new threat of neon-styled raiders known as the Highwaymen. Far Cry New Dawn includes light RPG elements including perks, loot, character cosmetic customization, and weapon crafting. This is my first Far Cry game, so I had no real comparisons to others in the series. 
Comparisons are still easy to draw in the open world genre though, and there's plenty of world to explore here. The plot that drives the game forward is fine enough. It's quite clear that the antagonist of Far Cry 5 is a bigger character than the twin leaders of the Highwaymen though. Most of the mechanics in Far Cry when it comes to the action and traversal feel fine-tuned, as if they've had multiple iterations of practice. Vehicle combat can be tense and frequent, and there's a lot of countryside to explore. If you like environmental storytelling, especially the kind that leads you to treasure, this game has it. Ranged combat, as well as stealth elements, work quite well, and quality of life mechanics seen in other games seem to have found their way into this one too. Just about everything worked great up until I hit a mission that required melee combat. This arena mission felt impossible to beat since I didn't have certain story abilities, and for some wild reason you can't block or dodge wielding melee weapons. Thankfully the option to just quit the mission was there, so I returned quite a while later and punched that mini arena boss into the stands. This game also has a co-op feature where you and a friend can save Hope County together. If you don't have something to play with, there are several companions in the game that can be recruited as well, like Timber, one of the best dog companions I've played a game with. Being this is an Ubisoft game, unfortunately it comes with having blatant storefront space for microtransactions transactions, and a handful of in-store currency that is lootable in the game world to remind players that this is a product rather than just a game. Thankfully, and this is a big one, New Dawn doesn't feel padded out to incentivize paying more for the game. I got this on sale for a little over 10 bucks anyway, and I recommend you buy this on discount. If you do decide to get New Dawn either way, it's still an experience worth having if you like vibrant wasteland playgrounds, potentially with a friend. Next up is Endzone, A World Apart by Gently Mad Studios. In this post-apocalyptic city builder, end zones were massive underground shelters which surviving humans took refuge in during the apocalypse. There's not much context to how the world ended up a wasteland besides terrorists worldwide blowing up nuclear reactors, but it's been 150 years since and flora and fauna are appearing once more. This is a sign for humanity to rise again. Your task in end zone is to create a thriving society from close to nothing by having your settlers gather, build, and repopulate the land. Since this is after the apocalypse, however, you'll also be dealing with droughts, sandstorms, acid rain, and other dangerous events that can halt growth if you're unprepared. Threats don't end with just weather patterns either. Once you've carved a place for your settlers, local raiders will take notice and the need for defenses will arise. On the exploring side, you'll also have the chance to send out expedition teams of gifted settlers to surrounding ruins. These expeditions can yield anything from basic resources to even more survivors to add to your population. Out of the two post-apocalyptic city builder games I've played, this is the one I'll recommend first because it's finally out of early access. The basics are simple in Endzone. Your settlers are going to need shelter, water, and food to survive. This expands out to the needs of tools and protective clothing, then it expands further to education, research, trade, power, and expeditions to surrounding ruins. If you're interested but new to the city builder genre, I'm happy to report that the tutorial for Endzone is incredibly well thought out, fully voiced, and even has shortcut links to the aspects of the game that are being described. It's been a long time since I've seen this much effort put into teaching players how a game works, and being someone who has made a living creating guides and walkthroughs, it's something I can definitely get behind. After completing the tutorial in End Zone, the game doesn't end if you don't want it to, and you're also able to just continue playing to see how large of a society you can create. And after learning what you need to, you can also take part in scenarios where the narrator will pose specific objectives for you to complete, like gathering so many different plant seeds. If you enjoy City Builders or even just enjoyed Fallout 4's settlement system but wanted a bit more out of it, give End Zone a try. You might just enjoy this too. For a games, Metro 2033 is a first-person story in the shoes of a man named Artyom, born on the surface but raised in the Metro. The apocalypse in this universe happened in 2013 and turned seemingly the entire world into an irradiated wasteland. The survivors in Moscow found safety in the city's branching metro tunnels. The game begins in 2033, strange, when an impending threat to what's left of humanity forces Artyom to venture to other metro station cities to warn them. The Redux version of Metro 2033 is updated to be on par with the mechanics and AI of the second game, Last Light. Metro is atmosphere. Sounds, fog, shadows, light rays, cramped spaces music, 
There's not much power fantasy here, except for Artyom's immunity to the mind-melting effects of an unknown origin. He is still just a man. What you do get here is a strong story, good characters, eerie exploration, paranormal events, and some intense combat. This game uses lighting and shadows to their fullest, and the creep factor even has the potential to make you jump once or twice. Or at least, make your skin crawl. The minimalist interface is great for immersion, but when it comes to wanting more information, sometimes there's just a lack of clarity and you have to experiment or look it up online. The metro isn't the only place you'll be spending your time either. Sometimes you will emerge to the frozen ruins on the surface and will have to wear a gas mask and maintain your filters, as well as watch the skies for threats too. Combat and stealth have their moments in Metro 2033 as well, but at the beginning, guns themselves feel fairly weak and by the end, the military-grade bullets used as currency up to this point are also used for most rifles late game. So then you're stuck deciding on whether you want to shoot literal money at those dang burrowing mutants, use your knife on them, or just run to the next area. Depending on what you're looking for, this next one is a pro or con. Metro 2033 is a linear story with only so much to explore. This makes it easier to get invested in the story, but it's a shorter experience as a result too. Luckily, if you enjoy the time with Metro 2033, there's two more games that come after it with just as much atmosphere, more story, and characters to appreciate. Mad Max by Avalanche Studios, while released around the time of the film, Fury Road, this is its own self-contained story. You play as Max Rokotansky, driven mad with the grief of losing his family and on a quest to reach the Plains of Silence. On his way, he's attacked by Scabarus Scrotus and his gang of war boys, his car and equipment stolen and left to die. With the help of a gifted hunchbacked companion, Chum Bucket, Max quietly vows vengeance on Scrotus as his wasteland rampage begins. Mad Max is a solid third person open world action title and one of the most dark when it comes to tone. There's no happy endings for Max Rokotansky, just survival and fury. A sizable chunk of this game will be spent driving around and demolishing enemy vehicles. Another good piece of the gameplay will be collecting scrap and raiding strongholds to reduce enemy control of the area. There is customization and improvements for vehicles as well as Max himself, and you'll be working towards recovering some of Max's repressed memories in the process. If you've played Shadow of Mordor or the Batman Arkham games, the hand-to-hand -hand combat will feel familiar with its counterattacking prompts. Enemy types are varied, and their difficulty will increase too with the need to dodge and use finishers later on. The Magnum Opus, Max's primary vehicle and Chum Bucket's holy task, is not just for getting from point A to B, but disabling outpost defenses, breaking gates, pulling down barriers, and once you've got enough upgrades to the harpoon, you can straight up yank drivers out of their cars. Lots of games can boast the rarity of ammunition, water, and food, but Mad Max actually sticks to keeping these few and far between, only to be used in a pinch. If you help the quote-unquote friendly strongholds of the area by collecting project parts and surrounding locations, they can eventually benefit Max upon his return, like filling water and ammo. The two biggest drawbacks to Mad Max is that the somber tone leaves little room for humor, and the camera will sometimes fight you when in hand-to-hand -hand combat or using the harpoon from your car. Despite these two things though, there's lots of car-crushing fun to be had in the world of Mad Max. Death Stranding. An unusual game from an unusual director, Hideo Kojima. Death Stranding takes place after a cataclysm that tore the seam, separating life and death, nearly extinguishing humans entirely. Players take on the role of Sam Bridges, a porter or delivery specialist that travels between surviving bunkers and cities, bringing valuable supplies. This game includes an asynchronous online feature that allows players to help each other with trailblazing, making roads, sharing equipment, building structures, and delivering lost cargo. These features and the story keep to the overarching theme of connection. Sam will not only be delivering packages, but connecting the remnants of humanity via a super internet known as the Chiral Network, while simultaneously connecting you with other players and their contributions, making future treks in this area much easier. There's more than just terrain between point A and B. Sam will also encounter BTs or beached things that will raise the dread and tension dramatically, or mules, which are delivery crazed bandits eager to steal the cargo he carries. 
with the summary out of the way, I need to make sure you hear me when I say Death Stranding is not for everyone. But I also believe describing it as a walking simulator way oversimplifies what you can get out of this game. Granted, Death Stranding is not the easiest game to describe by any means, so if you have prior experience to Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid series, you'll already be somewhat acclimated to his wild and weird, incredibly polished pseudo-movie director style. The first couple hours of the game being mostly cutscenes, you might find yourself confused. That's par for the course. I've completed the game more than two times, and there's still quite a few things in Death Stranding I just don't get. Even if you don't grasp the entirety of Death Stranding, there's tons of quiet, stressful, and beautiful moments to experience here. Carrying cargo on foot over hills, rivers, forests, mountains, and snow is a large part of the starting gameplay. However, you will unlock vehicles and equipment as you go to make the whole process more efficient, and even better versions if you keep delivering to specific locations. So rather than a walking simulator, I want to call this more of a logistics action game, because you can go hours without encountering BTs or bandits anywhere, but you can also fight them willingly for hours on end. And there's reasons for both. You're considering how many cases are being carried, how heavy are they, what kind of terrain will you face, can you take multiple deliveries in one trip, are there going to be hostiles along the way, should you bring weapons and armor. Each of these and more are considered for making deliveries. The coolest mechanic in Death Stranding, in my mind still, is the path making system. If you and other players travel the same path, shrubs, rocks, and debris will disappear and a trail will show up soon after, making future trips so much smoother. Stealth and combat are definitely elements in Death Stranding as well. There are boss fights and they incorporate both of these things. Unfortunately, the big story fights aren't introduced until many hours into the game. As I said, I firmly believe the Death Stranding isn't for everyone, but if you are curious about it, I don't think you should put all your trust in review and instead just try it for yourself. Death Stranding is divisive as a game, and yet, ironically, the central theme is connection. If you're out for taking the risk of exploring a post-apocalypse unlike any other you've ever seen, just try it. In Exiles, Wasteland 3 is a squad-based RPG that begins in the frozen Colorado wastes. The global nuclear apocalypse of the Wasteland universe occurred in 1998, and the Wasteland story begins nearly a century later as remnants of the U.S. Army engineers form the Desert Rangers of Arizona. With me so far? After the events of Wasteland 2, the Desert Rangers head to Colorado with the promise of resources from its leader so they can rebuild. These resources are promised only if the Rangers can help the Patriarch regain control of the area. Unfortunately, the Rangers are nearly wiped out on their way to Colorado Springs, and you play as the surviving duo from that encounter. This duo can either be two custom rangers or one of several presets available. The reason for starting as a duo is not just because this is a squad-based RPG, but that it also includes cooperative play, allowing you to share the party with a friend. Wasteland 3 is my number one pick, simply because I consider this to be one of the best wastelands available to us that isn't Fallout. And more people need to know that the developers of this game are a vital part of Fallout's legacy. In Exile is made up of former Interplay and Black Isle employees, the other side of the same coin as Obsidian. So with that in mind, you can expect Wasteland 3 to be full of RPG goodness and full of quality of life features that make it easy to approach. But it will still prove a challenge if that's what you're looking for. You should know that you don't have to play the previous Wasteland games to get into Wasteland 3 Heck, I haven't even been able to play the first game for more than a few minutes due to it coming out in 1988. There is a remastered version, by the way. Still have a hard time playing it. Thankfully, Wasteland 3 recaps the important moments of the Desert Ranger history with nods here and there for players familiar with the previous games. In Wasteland 3, there's plenty of player choice that has both instant consequence and some serious implications later on. There shouldn't be any worry of too much reading here either because NPCs are fully voiced and some of the important characters even have some up-close face-to-face time during conversations. Conflicts in both missions and during encounters can be dealt with head-on or often avoided for those of you who like pacifist playthroughs. Your squad of rangers can consist of six total, and because you'll be using a party of specialists instead of creating a single character able to be great at everything, you'll be shaping characters that complement the rest of the squad. Two of your team can also be story companions, who often have things to say as you explore Colorado, making the world feel alive. Speaking of combat, so much here works amazingly, 
Enemies have synchronized movement, which means you're not going to be waiting much longer than a few seconds for them to end their turns. The strategy portion of combat will involve the use of cover, flanking maneuvers, explosives, long-range bombardments, some up-close pummeling and slashing, or even something as weird as snowballs and a frozen ferret launcher. The punishing aspect of the combat will rear its head thanks to turns being squad-oriented instead of character to character. You will run into encounters at times that simply feel unfair because they probably are if the enemy gets the first turn. Saving often, especially before possible fights, is recommended. But sometimes you'll just need to get stronger and come back later. The variety of weaponry is vast and each have their own effective ranges, are moddable, and some grant abilities. Combat also includes the strike system, which is a super attack that your rangers can do after the strike meter fills. This devastating move can be a guaranteed precision attack, a large area stunning move, or even a massive explosion if you've got a rocket launcher. One of my favorite things about Wasteland 3 is the ease of inventory management. Your inventory is in a single pool, so no more sifting between characters to see who's carrying what, and there's also no carry capacity. I assume this can be explained away thanks to the Kodiak, the ranger's armored transport. The Kodiak is not just a vehicle for traveling the overworld either. It has weapon systems of its own and can assist during encounters with its main gun and launcher if they're equipped. Lastly, I'd like to mention the tonal tightrope that this game walks. It's bleak and depressing one minute and dark yet hilarious the next. This will persist through the entire game and will remind you that the DNA of the classic Fallout games exists just in a more modern form. Even though I'm clearly a fan of the classics, you know as well as I do that they're not easy to get into. If you have strong feelings and want to get into them but can't get past their age, seriously, give Wasteland 3 a shot. And that is 10 games for Fallout fans that aren't Fallout. I'm sure you had some that came to mind when you saw this video, so leave them in the comments. They may or may not be in my existing list already, but I'm down for more ideas. If you're new to the channel or haven't been here in a while, please check the stupid bell icon because th my stuff is not getting recommended to subscribers. And if you want more stuff like this, that's the easiest way to see them. And also there's Discord and stuff like that. Speaking of things that happen in Discord, my patrons, including Wasteland Legends Sven, are incredible and help keep this channel running. Thank you so much to them. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Kato Genesis, and may you wander the wasteland like you own it.